Good morning. Well, welcome us to church again across our location. So grateful to have all of you joining us. And uh, before we dive into Hebrews, we're gonna get there in just a moment. I wanna give you a quick update on something really exciting happening in the life of our church. As many of you know, we have been laying the groundwork over the last several months for a third Cross Point City Church campus in Rome, Georgia, which is awesome. And it is coming. Like about eight people are excited about Rome. And so... It's all good, it's all good. We'll let you redeem yourself in a moment. But, but no, it's coming. Listen, Sunday, September the 12th, I want you to mark this on your calendar. Sunday, September the 12th, we are launching that campus, okay? Uh, we have a church there in Rome that has been incredibly generous and gracious. They've been letting us use space over the last several months. And we're actually gonna launch in this church property, in this church building, Cornerstone in Rome. And so initially, we'll start at 5 p.m. on Sunday evenings. And then we're gonna keep praying for a location that would allow us to meet on Sunday mornings. But leading up to September the 12th, we're also doing preview gatherings. And so I just wanna get this on your radar because if you live in that community or you know people that live in that community, we want you to get there and we want you to help get them there to be a part of what we believe God is gonna do, okay? Uh, all the info for that Rome campus can be found on our website. Just go to crosspointcity.church and you can read all the details, find all the details but I also wanna thank all of you who invest weekly and, and monthly financially in the mission of Crosspoint because you did this. And, and I don't say that lightly, you did this, okay? Last year we launched our, our uh, vision initiative called MOVE and a key strategy of MOVE was church multiplication. This is church multiplication. And for those of you that give faithfully, you make this third campus happen. And so I just wanna thank you in advance for being a part of what God's gonna do in that city to change lives. So be in prayer, and then on the other side of that, we'll just share a lot of God's stories with you, okay? Of how he's, of how he's uh, worked. And so um, lastly, I would just say pray for the team. We got a lot of great people that are setting out to start that thing, and starting a church is no joke, all right? So... Just pray for those people because it's hard work. But with all that said, uh, we're gonna dive into Hebrews. All right, last weekend we started this brand new series called Greater Than. And for the next 21 weeks, we're gonna walk through this book together and we're gonna talk about the greatness or the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And so to help us with the series, our team put together a journal and we wanna make sure that you get one of these if you don't have one. We passed them out last week and I know our team was passing them out again, but if you still have not gotten one of these, would you just lift a hand wherever you are and we wanna bring you one because this is gonna be a help to you over the next several weeks. You can just keep your hand up and as they're passing these out, I will walk you back through the contents quickly, okay? Uh, on page one, you're gonna find a spot to write your name and your contact info. And so if you misplace it or you lose it, we wanna get this back to you. On page three, you're gonna find a breakdown of the contents. And so if you wanna see how we're gonna walk through the text together, walk through the book, how we've laid out the series, it's there. And then if you keep going, you're gonna find questions that you can work through either personally or in your small groups. And then there are a ton of note pages. And so we want you to bring this with you week after week, bring a pen, or if you need one, there's probably one around you. Keep really good notes. And by the end of these 21 weeks, you will have your very own personalized commentary on the book of Hebrews. How cool is that, all right? So uh, I do pray that this helps you, so take advantage of that, okay? Well, with your journal in hand, get your Bible in hand, let's go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter one. As you're turning there, have you ever noticed how we live in a society today that is strangely obsessed with angels? Have you noticed this? Uh, we write books about them. We make movies about them, we make TV shows about them, we sing songs about them. Some of us decorate our houses with them. And then you got a whole group of people who believe that we become angels after we die. Y'all have seen this, right? Uh, you jump on Instagram or Facebook and someone has passed away and there is a friend or a family member, a loved one, who posts, so-and-so got their wings. And listen, I wanna be sympathetic and I wanna be gentle and careful, but I also wanna be honest and I wanna say, no, they didn't. And as believers in Christ, we have to stop talking like that, okay? Human beings are not angelic beings and human beings do not become angelic beings after death. See, the great hope of Christianity is this, that after death, we become like Christ. 
This is the ultimate hope, that after we die, our bodies go into the ground and our souls leave our bodies and go immediately into the presence of the Lord. And one day in the future, he's returning. And when he does, he will redeem and restore all things, including us. He's gonna resurrect our bodies up from the ground, reunite our souls with those bodies, and we'll live in those bodies with the resurrected Jesus for eternity. That is Christianity. And I don't know about you. Look, you can be an angel if you want after you die. I just wanna be like Jesus, amen? Some of y'all are with me, but, but here's my point. Listen, what's true in our culture was also true in the culture to which the letter of Hebrews came. I told you this last week, but this letter was written to Jewish Christians. Okay, these were people who had been raised in Judaism and come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so they were very, very familiar with all that happened in the Old Testament, including God speaking to them through the prophets, which he did for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then eventually the prophets died and the Old Testament closes and God went silent for some 400 years. Uh, that period, that, that 400 year time frame, that's what's known as the intertestamental period. It's the period between the New Testament and the Old Testament. And when you study literature from that period, what you find is that the Jewish people became really weirdly obsessed with angels. Uh, they believed that angels were not only God's messengers and their protectors, but that one day an army of angels would return to planet Earth and vindicate them and rescue the nation. And it was also during this time period that the idea of personal or guardian angels developed. And so in light of this cultural obsession, here's what was happening at the time of this book. These people were being tempted to reduce Jesus down to an angelic being. You see, because of their faith in Christ, they were experiencing persecution, not only from the Romans, but opposition from their Jewish neighbors. Like they couldn't even attend synagogue because of their belief in Jesus. And so here's what they thought. Well, maybe if we just say Jesus is an angel, we don't have to outright deny him, but we could potentially avoid the suffering we're facing because of him. And so in the opening text, in the opening uh, pages of this letter, the author writes to clarify this relationship between Jesus and the angels. And here's what he says. We're gonna pick it up in the back half of verse three. He writes, after making purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, O Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain." They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up, like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same and your years have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? All right, here's what's going on in these 11 verses. The author quotes seven Old Testament passages. Because remember, these were Jewish Christians, very familiar with the Old Testament. And so the book of Hebrews is a very, very Jewish book. In just 13 chapters, there are 38 Old Testament quotations, 55 Old Testament allusions for a grand total of 93 Old Testament references. And so what the author's doing is simply this. He is taking seven passages from the Old Testament and applying them to Jesus to make a very simple point, and it's this. Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is not an angel, but instead, Jesus is greater than the angels. And he's greater in four ways, okay? For all of you theological Bible nerds like me who, who love just going real in-depth to the scriptures, you're gonna love this next part of, of the sermon. Um, we're gonna get very theological, very technical, and then at the end, we're gonna get very practical. So some of y'all practical people, pragmatic, you're just gonna need to stay with me, all right? But lock in, this is important stuff. Number one, his name is greater. 
His name is greater. The author says it in verses four and five. His name is more excellent than their names. Now, the question is, what name are we talking about? Because in the scriptures, there are many names given for God. There are many names given for Christ. So what name is he, is he speaking of? Well, the name he's speaking of is the Son of God. That's very, very apparent in the text, okay? The first Old Testament uh, passage he quotes is Psalm 2-7. You're my son, today I've begotten you. And Psalm chapter two is a messianic psalm. It's believed by the Jewish people that this is a psalm that speaks about their coming savior, their coming Messiah. And in Acts 13, the apostle Paul, he quotes the same psalm and he makes this point. The resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of Psalm 2-7. So in other words, when Jesus rose from the dead, it proved that he's truly the son of God. Okay, he didn't become the son of God at his resurrection. You, you tracking with me? Um, he has always been the son of God. He is the eternal son of God. It's just that his resurrection vindicated him in that way. In the Roman Greco world, this would have made a lot of sense. Uh, back at the time of this writing, if you had a son, that son was your son, but when he came of a certain age, the family name was bestowed upon him in a very formal way. And so he was a son throughout his entire life, but at a certain point, it became official. He's the son in the family. And so again, the point that the author's making and the point that Paul makes is this, when Jesus rose from the dead, it became official. He truly is the son of God. The author goes on and he quotes 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And this passage comes right out of what's known as the Davidic covenant. Okay, 2 Samuel 7, I've told you this before, is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. Absolutely one of the most important chapters in the Old Testament. So I would say study it, know it, memorize it, learn it. But in 2 Samuel 7, King David, the most famous king in Israel's history, he's kind of frustrated because he's living in this incredible kingly palace and God is living outside in a tent. And so he comes to a friend, his name is Nathan, and he says, listen, I, I wanna do something about this. It's not right that I'm living in here while God is living out there, so I'm gonna build God a house. Well, God comes to Nathan that very night and he says, I want you to tell David he's not gonna build me a house, I'm gonna build him a house. And then he makes some incredible promises to this king. Listen, he tells David, I'm gonna use you to raise up a king and a kingdom for myself. This kingdom will be eternal and it will be ruled by a son belonging to me. That son will secure my people and give them eternal rest from their enemies. And so the point the author of Hebrews is making is this. The son is Jesus. He is the messianic son prophesied in Psalm 2-7. He is the Davidic son promised by God to David in 2 Samuel 14. God the Father never calls an angel son, but he does call Jesus son, therefore his name is greater. And because his name is greater, he's greater than the angels. Okay, point number two, his honor is greater. His honor is greater. This is what we see in verse six. In verse six, the author quotes Deuteronomy 32, 43, which says, let all the angels worship him. Now, if you go back to Deuteronomy and you study this text, the, the, the verse is actually referring to Yahweh, which is the Hebrew name for God. And so here in Hebrews, this author is making the connection for us. Jesus is God. Jesus is Yahweh. And then he takes us back to the Christmas story. So we're gonna have Christmas in August for just a moment, okay? What he's pointing out is this, that when God the Father sent Jesus the Son into the world, at his birth, the angels of heaven had a worship session. So we see in Luke chapter two. Jesus is born, and then the angels appear to these lowly shepherds. Hey, a, a savior's been born in the city of David, and then they break out in song. They break out in worship. Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom he is pleased. But I need you to know that Angelic worship of Jesus didn't start at his birth. The angels were worshiping Jesus long before his birth. And I wanna give you just one example from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter six, it's one of my favorite texts. Uh, I would encourage you again, read that and know that. It is a powerful story. But in it, Isaiah the prophet goes into the temple to mourn the death of King Uzziah, the king in Jerusalem. And when he walks into the temple, he sees the Lord high and lifted up, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe is filling the temple. And we know from the Gospel of John, John 12, 41, that who he saw, it was Jesus. 
It was the pre-incarnate Jesus, Jesus ruling and reigning before Jesus was ever born into the world. And Jesus on his throne, he was surrounded by angels who were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. And he tells us that each of these angels had six wings. With two, they were flying, and with two, they were covering their face, and with two, they were covering their feet. Because listen, even angelic beings who were created to exist in the presence of God have to acknowledge the glory and the majesty of Jesus when they encounter him. Can I tell you that their worship continues today? It's not that they just did worship him before his birth and at his birth but the worship of King Jesus continues right now in present time, okay? We see it in Revelation four and five. You and I are here worshiping Jesus while Jesus is back on his throne in his resurrected, glorified body, surrounded by eternal beings, angelic beings who are falling on their faces and crying out day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Why do the angels give Jesus that kind of honor? because his honor is greater than their honor. Angels don't deserve this type of honor and even the angels of heaven know it. I mean, we see this in Revelation 19, the apostle John encounters this angel and he falls on his face to worship the angel and the angel basically says, no, you gotta get up, bro, we can't do this. Like you're not supposed to be worshiping me, you just need to worship Jesus, he is the only one worthy of that. And so listen, you and I, we don't worship angels. Angels don't worship angels. There was one angel in history who thought he was worthy of worship and his name was Satan and he was kicked out of heaven for his pride. We don't do what he does. We don't worship angels. We join in with the angels and we worship the resurrected Jesus because he is the only one worthy of honor and praise. Amen? Number three, his being is greater. His being is greater. This is what we see in verses 10 through 12. Here, the author quotes Psalm 102, verses 25 and 27, which again is a passage about Yahweh, and he applies this passage to Jesus to make two primary points. Number one, Jesus is creator. He's creator. He's not created. He is creator. Okay, we talked about this last week. In the text, we learned that Jesus is the agent of creation, that God the Father used Jesus the Son, the Son acted on his behalf to bring the heavens and the earth into existence. And so think about this with me. Logically, that means if Jesus is the creator of all things, who did he create? Starts with an A, we're talking about him today. He created the the angels, right? You see, angels are not eternal beings. Jesus is an eternal being. The author says it, your years have no end, but angels are temporal beings. They have a beginning point. We have no idea when they were created because the Bible doesn't tell us, and we don't know how many were created because the Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, We have a hint in Revelation 5.11 where John has this vision, and he sees angels that are numbering 10,000 times 10,000. You're talking 100 million angels or more. That's a lot of angels. There's a lot we don't know about them, but what we do know is that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, created them, which, by the way, completely contradicts what Jehovah Witnesses believe. Um, Do you know that Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is an angel? That he is the archangel Michael, which completely goes against the case that the author's making here. And it's problematic because if Jesus is an angel, that means he's a created being and a created being cannot create other beings. The argument falls apart. The truth is Jesus is an eternal being and he's God and he's creator. And so therefore his being is greater because he created them. Number two, the author points out that Jesus is unchanging. This is really good news for us. He's unchanging. In theology, we call this the immutability of God, that he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so while creation changes, again, Jesus never changes. The heavens and the earth, okay? This is the point the author makes. The heavens and the earth, they change. They're like your favorite pair of jeans, okay? Um, You wear them and you wear them and you wear them and you wear them and every couple months you wash them. That's gross. You probably should wash them a little bit more than that, but you wear them and wear them and wear them. And then over time, they fade and they diminish and they wear out and they get holes and eventually they perish and you throw them away. And in the text, we read that the heavens and the earth, they're kind of like that. They're like an old garment. They're gonna grow old and they're gonna wear out and they're gonna fade and they're gonna diminish. They're gonna change, but Christ will remain. And at one point in the future, upon his return, what he's gonna do is roll up the heavens and the earth like a garment, and he's going to change them yet again. 
This is the idea here of recreation, that the universe will not be annihilated by Christ, it's gonna be remade by Christ, and so just like you and I will receive brand new resurrected bodies, Someday in the future, the universe itself will receive a brand new resurrected body. And so in that way, creation itself is entirely dependent upon Jesus. And because the angels are created beings, they are entirely dependent upon Jesus for their existence. Therefore, his being is greater than their being. Okay, one more point, then we'll get into the practical stuff. Number four, his status is greater. His status is greater. This is what we see in verses seven through nine and again in verses 13 and 14. Uh, the author begins by quoting Psalm 104.4. God makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. So the idea is simply this. Angels are servants. Angels are ministers. That's reiterated down in verse 14 where we're told that angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are to inherit salvation. And I wanna give you a couple of example stories to put this in perspective, okay? Back in the 1800s, there was a guy named John Patton. He was a Scottish missionary. Uh, he and his wife moved from Scotland to a group of islands in the South Pacific. And they went to do missionary work amongst a cannibalistic people. And so one night, these cannibalistic people, they show up at Patton's house and they are ready to kill him and his wife. And so they hit the floor, man. They're on their knees, they're on their faces, they're praying, they're asking God for protection. And they ended up praying all through the night. Well, as the sun began to rise, they peeked out the window and they noticed that tribe of people's gone. They've disappeared, they're nowhere to be seen. Well, about a year later, the chief of that cannibalistic tribe came to faith in Jesus Christ as his savior and Lord. And so Patton came and he was talking to him and, and he decided to bring up that night. Hey, hey man, you, you remember that night? About a year ago, you showed up at my house, you're gonna kill us. He said, what happened on that night? Why did you leave? And the chief, he answered the question with a question. He said, well, tell me this, who were all those men with you? And Patton said, there, there were no men with us. He said, it was just my wife and I in the house praying, asking the Lord to protect us. And the chief started to argue. He said, no, no, there were men with you, men, tall men in shining garments, circling your house with swords in hand. And so we left and we ran away. <laughs> Angels, ministering spirits sent out to serve the people of God. Now, I know for some of you skeptics, you're like, wow, James, that was a long time ago. I don't know if I believe that. Let me share a personal story with you if I can, okay? Um, back in college, my, my brother, we were, I was a senior, he was a freshman. Uh, back in college, my brother, kid brother, got into a horrific car accident. They gave him a 10% chance of survival when they took him from the scene. Praise God, he is alive today. God did a miracle in his life. But they ended up having to lifelight him to Grady Hospital. He was in ICU in the trauma unit for weeks. And in the weeks that we were there, we had different people come and visit us, friends, family members, church members. But there was a guy who showed up that we had never met and we didn't know, his name was Keith. And he was the first man on the scene of the accident that night. And he actually stayed by my brother's side from the time of the accident until he was put in the ambulance to be taken away. And so Keith shows up, not a believer in Christ, by the way. And he tells us a story about a man in a brown jacket. And he says, there I was, I was... I was down by John, he's panicking, he's in and out of consciousness, he's losing a lot of blood, he kept asking me if he was gonna die, and I was trying to comfort him best I could. He said, and then out of nowhere walks up this guy in a brown jacket, he had a flashlight, and he shined the light in John's face, and he told me to stay with him and that he was gonna be okay. Well, at the end of the night, as they were cleaning up the scene of the accident, Keith, he finds a flashlight on the side of the road. And so he goes to the officer in charge and he says, hey, this flashlight belongs to the guy in the brown jacket. And the police officer says, what guy in a brown jacket? I, I, don't, I don't know who you're talking about. I haven't seen a guy in a brown jacket. And so the cop goes to all the other officers and they start talking to the firefighters and they start talking to the paramedics. Nobody on the scene of the accident saw a guy in a brown jacket except for Keith. Well, weeks later, my brother wakes up from a medically induced coma. He has no idea where he is. He doesn't know what happened. He has no recollection of the accident. And so we're telling him why he's there, uh, about the experience he's been through. And my mom and my dad and I just decided, why don't we ask him about the guy in the brown jacket? So we did, hey, John, do, do you remember a guy in a brown jacket and his eyes lit up? And he said, I, I remember him. I remember him. I, I remember now 
lay in on the side of the road, panicking, anxious, had no idea if I was gonna live or die. And I remember there was a guy with me And I I remember this guy in a brown jacket walking up and shining a light in my face and telling the guy who was with me to stay with me and that I was gonna be okay. And he said, I just had this supernatural peace fall over me and I knew God had me. Listen, I, I could be wrong, okay? I could be wrong. But my family and I, we're convinced that was a spirit sent by King Jesus to minister and to serve my brother in a moment when he needed the supernatural comfort of God. We believe that. Listen, I know some of you probably have similar stories. I had people after Thursday night coming up and and sharing similar stories. And these stories about angelic encounters, they're amazing and they speak of the beauty and the greatness of angels, but here's what we have to keep in mind. Jesus is greater. He's greater. His status is greater. You see, angels are servants and Jesus is king. This is what the author goes on to tell us. Verses eight through nine, he quotes Psalm 45, six through seven. That the son of God right now is seated on an eternal throne, that he rules in righteousness, that he hates wickedness, that he rules with joy and gladness. Praise God, that sounds a lot different from many of our leaders in the world today. And so we're grateful for Jesus. And then in verse 13, he quotes Psalm 110.1. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110.1, by the way, is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. So if you ever play Bible trivia and anybody asks you that question, now you know the answer. It's Psalm 110.1. It's quoted some 14 times. But, but here's the idea behind the verse. In the ancient world, if a king conquered another king in battle, the conquered king, it was customary for him to lay prostrate on the ground and he would kiss the feet of the victorious king. And that victorious king would then put his foot on the neck of the defeated king and he would make that guy his footstool. So the author of Hebrews is teaching this, that Jesus, this is what he's doing right now. He's king, he's ruling and reigning, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And one day in the future, when he returns in bodily form, he will finish that work. He will crush every enemy. Satan, sin, death, hell, it will all be over in its entirety and Jesus Christ will rule and reign perfectly over his world yet again. And so think about this, here he is, he's ruling, he's reigning, angels, they're busy serving, therefore Jesus is greater than the angels. Now in light of all that, here's the big practical question we ask, what do we do with that? I mean, it's great that Jesus is greater than the angels, right? So what? Uh, What does that mean for our lives today? Here's the simple answer I would give you. I I believe it means that we do what the angels do. If Jesus is truly greater than the angels, then you and I need to follow the lead of the angels and we need to do what the angels do. So in other words, instead of doing what the recipients of this letter were being tempted to do, which was to reduce Jesus down to something less than he is, and can we just all agree that it's so easy to do in our culture and society today? Come on, you know it. If you go out there into the world and you start making exclusive claims about Jesus, John 14, six claims about Jesus. Oh, no, no, Jesus, he's the only way to God. He's not a way. He's not an option. He's the only way. If you wanna get to the Father, you have to go through him. I don't know, Jesus is the truth about God. He's not one of many truths. He is the truth. If you wanna know who God is, you have to look to Jesus because that's who he is. I don't know, he is the one who gives you life and the only one who can give you life. You can't earn it, you can't work your way into it, nothing and no one else can give it to you, only Jesus can give it to you. If you make claims like that out there, you are bound to offend someone. But here's what I say, as respectfully as I can, let them be offended. Because if we truly wanna honor Jesus, and we truly wanna help people who don't know Jesus to know him and follow him, we have to hold him up for who he is. And doing that means that we do what the angels do. So let me describe it for you. Practically, you start by submitting to Jesus. You submit to Jesus. In Philippians chapter two, verses nine through 10, we are told that God the Father has bestowed on Jesus the Son the name that is above every name. And that at his name, one day, Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth. We're talking about people in hell here, okay? In addition, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord all to the glory of God the Father. So that's coming. And because that's coming, here's the choice you and I have to make right now in the present. 
We can choose to willingly submit to Jesus now or we can wait and be forced to do it then. And I'm telling you this because I love you. At some point, you will submit. Even if you don't do it now, at some point, you will. Like you can spend your entire life poking your chest out in pride at Jesus and one day you will take a knee. You can spend your entire life spouting off at the mouth, like talking about who Jesus is and who he's not and who you are and what you're not gonna do and who you're not gonna be. And at one point, when you see him face to face, you're gonna use your very own tongue and you are going to confess him as Lord. It will happen. And so out of love for you and concern for you, here's my encouragement. Just do it now. Humble yourself before Jesus and do it now. Because if you wait and you do it then, you're forced to do it, it's too late for you. Like at that point, you have missed out on experiencing eternal life with the Son of God who gave his life to save you. And so just humble yourself before the one who gave everything for you and submit to him now. Number two, we worship Jesus. We worship Jesus. Isn't it incredible to think that while many people stand in amazement of the angels, the angels stand in amazement of Jesus Many people are mesmerized by the angels. The angels are mesmerized by Jesus. And I say we join in with them. That we don't stand in awe of them, we stand in awe of him and we join in with the angels and we worship the one who is worthy of worship and praise. Now, I know when I talk about worship, some of you immediately think of singing. Oh, it's what we did a few minutes ago and it's what we're gonna do after the sermon. We, we sing and singing is one of the ways that we worship, but worship as a category is much bigger than singing. Uh, worship is a lifestyle. Worship is when you live each and every day in obedience to Jesus Christ in response to the grace and the mercy he has poured out on you so that he receives glory and honor from the way you live your life. This is worship. Paul talks about it in Romans 12.1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay, here's what I love about the construction of Romans, the book of Romans. Paul spends 11 chapters just plunging the depths of the gospel. Hey, I want you to know God created all things and you're a bunch of sinners who've ignored him in the world that he's made and you deserve wrath and you deserve judgment and the penalty of your sin is death, but God is gracious and he sent his son and Jesus Christ has done for you what you could never do on your own by his life, his death and resurrection and if you'll put your faith in him, he will save you and then he gets to chapter 12 and he goes, and what's the response? You give everything to him. You hold nothing back from Jesus but you offer your life as a sacrifice and in offering your life in that way, it's an act of worship. And here's what's incredible to think about. When you worship Jesus like that, by giving him all of who you are, you are doing what the angels do. You are literally participating in the very worship happening around his throne right now in present time. Number three, we depend on Jesus. We depend on Jesus. You know, like I know that we live in a broken world that is constantly changing, right? And as people who live in a world that is constantly changing, you and I, as created beings, we are constantly changing. Our health changes, our job situations change, our relationships change, our income changes, our 401k changes. Hopefully not in the wrong direction, right? Hopefully it keeps going that way and not that way, but, but here's the deal. What that means is that, that if you are putting hope or finding hope in worldly things, your hope can be lost at any moment because things change. But the good news is Jesus never changes. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so you never have to wonder what you're getting with him. Well, I wonder what kind of mood Jesus is in today because I really need to talk to him. <laughs> Hope he's not angry or upset or tired or frustrated like, oof. I wonder if his promises are still good for me. He's told me he was gonna do some stuff and I don't know, I've had a hard week. I haven't been very faithful and so I just, I just wonder if he's gonna keep those. I wonder if his mercy is new for me this morning because after yesterday, I really need some new mercy and I just wonder if he's gonna be faithful in that way. Again, listen to me, Jesus never changes. Therefore, to depend upon Jesus is to depend upon someone who is immovable, who is unshakable, who is sure. 
He's never gonna lie to you, never gonna leave you, never gonna fail you, never going to abandon you. No, Jesus is the same as he's always been. And so even when the world around you is changing, Jesus holds you steady because he never changes. And that's really good news for those of us who are suffering today, isn't it? It's really good news for those of us who are struggling today to know that if we will run to Jesus and cling to him and trust in him and depend upon him, that he will see us through no matter what's going on around us. That's good news. And then finally, number four, we serve Jesus. We serve Jesus. And how do we serve Jesus? Well, we we serve him by serving people that he sends us out to serve. Okay, think about this with me. The angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve people. You and I are human beings, physical people, who have been sent out into the world to serve people. Okay, Jesus tells us this in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when you study the New Testament, you find that he sends us into the world to serve people in some specific ways. Number one, we start by being good neighbors. This is part of the great commandment. We love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbors like we love ourselves, which simply means don't be a jerk. Seriously, don't be arrogant, don't be prideful, stop making life all about you. But in every relationship, you count that other person as more significant than you, and you consider their needs before your own, their desires before your own, their interests before your own, and every day you just look for ways to pour yourself out for the sake of other people, because that's what Christ did for you. Be a good neighbor. Um, He sends us out in the world to show compassion and to do mercy. Where we see this call in Matthew 25, we are to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty, thirsty, to invite the stranger, to clothe the naked, to visit the prisoner, to care for the sick. If you ever wondered why we're so passionate about doing those things here at Crosspoint, that's why. Jesus tells us to. I want you to fight for suffering people. I want you to act for people who can't act for themselves because Christ did it for us. And it's our job to represent him to the world. And then thirdly, and most importantly, Jesus sends us out to proclaim the gospel to lost and dying people. See, the truth is, the spiritual need is the greatest need. And the only way we can meet the spiritual need is by proclaiming the good news about the person and work of Jesus Christ, amen? And so in essence, we do what the angels do. Jesus is on his throne, ruling and reigning. We are awaiting his return, and we need to be here in this broken world serving people so that those people experience his power and his presence through our lives. So as we close, here's the question I want you to wrestle with. Where do you need to be more like the angels? That would be my question. Do you need to submit to Jesus? Take a knee, bow before him, confess him to be Lord, Some of you might need to do that for the first time, and I'm gonna give you the opportunity before you leave today. Um, Maybe you need to worship Jesus, not just by singing more worship songs, but by releasing areas of your life to him that you've been holding back. It's a matter of walking in greater obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit in response to what Christ has done for you. Do you need to depend upon Jesus? Again, man, I, I know in a room this size, especially with Dearsville, folks joining us online. Like there are people suffering, people who are struggling. Maybe you are depending on things outside of Jesus to carry you through right now. And and you know today, I gotta stop that and I've gotta turn to him. Or maybe again, you just need to serve. You gotta quit being a jerk, be like Jesus. Love people like Jesus has loved you. So where do you need to be more like them? All right, here's how our response time is gonna work today. Uh, In a few moments, we're gonna take communion together. We're gonna sing a couple songs and then we'll partake in this meal, this very, very significant Christian meal by which we remember the atoning sacrificial death of Christ for our sins. And we always wanna do that in a worthy manner. This is what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 11. And taking communion in a worthy manner means number one, that you only partake if you know Christ, okay? Um, unbelievers who are with us, we don't wanna leave you out of most things that we do, but this is something we have to leave you out of because you can't remember someone you've never met. Now, if you wanna meet him in a moment, then feel free to come and and to partake. Um, But we would just ask you, if you don't know Christ, to refrain from partaking, no judgment, no condemnation. You can sing with us and it'll all be good. But then believer in Christ, if you're gonna partake in a worthy manner, it means you confess any unconfessed sin, that you come clean before the Lord, you ask him to wash you and to cleanse you and to restore fellowship. 
It also means that you deal with any conflict you might have with a brother or sister in Christ. Like we don't wanna come to the table as a family divided. And so it may mean sending that text or looking at your spouse and going, sorry, I was a jerk this morning. I need you to forgive me. And so, so you can come and partake. And so what we're gonna do is the band's gonna come at both locations in a moment and they're gonna lead us in a time of singing. And I want you as we sing to do business with the Lord, okay? If there's some things you need to deal with, don't act like everything's fine, just deal with those things so that in a few moments we can come and partake together in a way that would honor Jesus. For those of you who need to give your lives to Jesus, I wanna give you the chance to do that now, okay? So if we can, cross locations, bow in this moment. If you need to give your life to Jesus today, put your faith in him, just tell him that. Right now in prayer, tell him, Jesus, I need you to be my savior because I know I'm a sinner and I can't save me. And then tell him you believe, I believe that you died a death I deserve so that I could be forgiven of all my sins, so that I could be loved and accepted by God and then confess, Jesus, you're Lord. You are king. You rose from the dead. You've conquered death and hell for me. And I believe only you can give me new and eternal life. So just ask for it, Jesus. Would you do that? Would you save me? Give me life today. Jesus, I hand the reins of my life over to you. And I wanna follow you the rest of my life. Father, over the next few moments as we sing and respond, I pray that you would be at work. God, convict of sin, comfort where comfort is needed. God, if there are relationships that need to be repaired, God, I pray that restoration would happen. Father, we give you this time and, and we just say again, we need you, we want you, we desire you. And so, God, would you pour out your presence? Holy Spirit, come and work amongst us. Do things in this place that, that none of us can take credit for. God, we pray all this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.